Let's pray. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, beautiful time, and beautiful moment to come together, Lord Jesus, and just glorify your name, Master. This time, Father God, as we are going to study your word, Lord, we ask you that, Lord Jesus, give us your heavenly revelation, give us heavenly understanding, Father God, give us heavenly wisdom, and so that, Lord Jesus, we will understand things, Father God. And we pray that, Lord Jesus, as man is teaching us, Lord, help her and guide her, Lord Jesus, so that she will bring a good content to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We submit all students to your mighty hand, and this time, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you so much. I seem to be having some notification here. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, so in John chapter 21, uh, we reached the uh, you know portion where there's a conversation going on between Jesus and Peter. And uh, uh, Jesus now begins to ask Peter whether he loves him or not. And um, uh, we did not get into the words, the meaning of the words and all of that, uh, because uh, we wanted to first look at some other aspects of this passage. So we just looked at the significance of feeding the lambs. And we looked at how uh, Jesus is asking Peter to be a better shepherd uh, than the shepherds in, the, in Ezekiel, who were, you know, the, the false shepherds were mentioned in Ezekiel, who did not care anything for the flock. But here, uh, he is giving uh, Peter the mandate uh, to feed his lambs and feed his sheep and to be a, a better shepherd to them. So we looked at how we, if we are, uh, if we have made a commitment to the Lord saying that, yes, Lord, we love you more than all of these other things, then we would need to be uh, the kind of uh, shepherds uh, who are the exact opposite of the people in Ezekiel uh, 36. So we, in fact, we looked at some of the um, aspects over there which are involved. Uh, what, what exactly would true shepherding mean? Uh, it would mean helping those who are weak. Uh, it, it would mean having to, uh, you know, bring back those who are lost. Um, it would mean actually going and seeking for those who have strayed away, all of those things. Uh, so we looked at those aspects of this passage. And um, just another you know, little thing that we can touch upon before we you know, have a discussion regarding the terms and the words and all of that. Um, there are three things that Jesus says to him. Uh, Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. Uh, then he says, take care of my sheep. And he says, feed my sheep. Uh, so the wording over there uh, is slightly different. Uh, it talks about feeding. And it also talks about taking care of them. And there are two different Greek words used over there. So the feeding basically means you know, taking the sheep out to pasture and uh, you know, giving them uh, um, pastures where they can graze. That is, the, is, of course, the basic general meaning of the word feed, uh, bosco. On the other hand, the other word that Jesus uses, where he says, you know, take care of my sheep, uh, poimino, that's the word over there. Uh, over there, it, it's um, more in the sense of, uh, you know, governing them, being a leader, uh, you know, leading them, uh, taking care of uh, all the matters which go, you know, with being a leader. So there are two aspects that uh, Jesus is asking Peter to take on. Not only would he just be grazing the sheep, uh, as in providing nourishment to the believers, but he also would have to uh, literally lead them. And uh, he would have to shoulder the responsibility that comes with you know, uh, taking care of a people and uh, running an entire ministry and planting churches and all of that. I'm very sorry. My, I have a very bad allergy. So. Um, so we see that um, uh, taking care of sheep involves not just uh, sharing the word with them and nurturing them in the faith, uh, but also taking care of all the other matters that would be involved. And later we see that in the early church, where uh, you have the 
uh, leaders, you know, attending to the widows, taking care of the distribution of the food. Um, they go from place to place um, for doing follow up on the new churches that have been set up. So uh, all that would be uh, both Bosco as well as Poema, you know, both of those aspects of taking care of the sheep um, get covered. Now let's just, you know, uh, come to the uh, the uh, controversy that generally surrounds this uh, whole idea of agape and filio. Um, now, um, actually, earlier, there really was no controversy uh, regarding these words. And they were just simply understood as synonyms. Uh, in some places, you just have the word agape being used. And in some places, you have the word phileo being used. And um, uh, it was just always understood that uh, John almost uses these two phrases interchangeably. Uh, you know, uh, the same way we do uh, in English, right? Uh, we try to use two, three different words uh, instead of using one single word just to bring variety in the in our writing, um, in, in the way that we are expressing uh, something. So uh, it was not considered to hold any uh, inner significance, these words. Uh, but then um, what happened was that in 1960, uh, C.S. Lewis brought out a book uh, it, it, uh, called The Four Loves. Uh, I think that was, yeah, The Four Loves, um, in which he kind of uh, graded the three, the four words, and he said, see, this is the superior word, and then the other words are, you know, kind of inferior. And uh, um, there were people who protested at that time and said, uh, you see, this doesn't really match up with, uh, you know, when, when we do a Greek study of the New Testament, it doesn't really match up with what you are saying. Uh, but then back in those days, um, his book went on to become very popular and very widely known. And the people who were protesting and you know pointing out the errors, um, they were not famous enough and their voices were not heard. Uh, so um, somehow this kind of um, uh, teaching gained a lot of ground. And um, um, but anyone who base, who studies even basic Greek, you know, right in the first year of their education when they are, you know, studying biblical Greek, immediately they begin to see that in so many passages throughout the New Testament, um, the two words are almost used like normal um, synonyms, uh, both meaning the same thing. Uh, almost, of course, uh, there is, of course, a slight variation, uh, but nothing so significant where you would say that this is a superior kind of love and the other is an inferior kind of love. Uh, we don't see that kind of uh, uh, demarcation anywhere in our um, New Testament passages. Uh, so this was something that uh, it was an artificial uh, categorization that was brought in by C.S. Lewis, and um, it's not really quite applicable uh, to the New Testament. And in fact, we will look at some scriptures, you know, uh, to uh, to talk about this further. Now, um, when we look at the dictionaries which are there, right, which, uh, you know, you have the Wines uh, Dictionary of um, Old Testament and New Testament words. Uh, you have the Mounds Expository Dictionary of, uh, of uh, Old and New Testament words. Uh, when we look at these, uh, you know, good solid dictionaries, uh, you know, which have uh, uh, good data in them, in in uh, uh, in these dictionaries, we they point out the fact uh, that there is not much variation between these terms. And um, it is in the Mounds Dictionary that it actually says that um, when in back in those days, in uh, you know during the, their times in biblical times, uh, when the word agape was used, it was just simply used as a synonym for the other two words phileo and eros. Uh, there was no uh, real meaning attached to it. And then biblical writers, when they began to use this word agape, they thought, let's use this you know, mainly for uh, God's love. So it, uh, the meaning for this word does not really come out so much from the Greek uh, language of that time. Rather, the biblical writers decided to start using this word agape uh, mainly for God's love. And uh, so they kind of gave it a special nuance, which the word did not have earlier. So in many passages, you do see agape being used uh, to talk about God's love for the for the for the people. Um, however, uh, in many of the passages in the New Testament, you have the uh, word agape being uh, 
continued to be used in the common sense in which that word was used back then in those days. And uh, you know, just to look at a couple of examples of that, uh, John chapter 12, you know, if someone could read out John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Do I have the students with me? Could someone read out, please? Um, am I audible, Pastor? Oh, please go ahead. John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. but. For fear of the Pharisees did not confess it so that they would not be part put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God. So over so, here we have uh, leaders who um, you know believe in Jesus, but they don't come forward uh, and they don't um, you know acknowledge Jesus because they agape the human praise more than the praise from God. So the word over there uh, is just used in the normal sense uh, of um, as a synonym of love. And uh, so it's not uh, some kind of divine love, nor is it some kind of pure form of love. It's just love. They chose to love the uh, human praise more than more than God's praise. Now, when we look at 2 Timothy 4.10, we see something similar over there. It talks about Demas, you know, who um, who leaves the Lord. He leaves the faith and goes back into the world. And it says over there that Demas, because he agape this world, uh, he has deserted me, is what Paul says. Uh, so over there, uh, the agape is being used uh, for love of the world. So it was just a common word uh, which was used in those times. Uh, but we, of course, see in many biblical passages where the word agape is being used for uh, God's love specifically. Um, if there is any difference between these two terms, it is mainly that agape uh, focuses more on the object which is being loved. As in, you, you value that object and uh, you consider that object important. Like in the case of Demas, he really loved the world. Uh, for him, the world was so attractive and, and precious. And he was willing to make sacrifices. He was willing to give up God. He was willing to go back and uh, you know backslide for the sake of this world which he loves so agape maybe could be said as a love that um, kind of uh, treasures the object that it is loving so in that sense uh, the biblical writers began to use it for god's love because god instead of you know thinking about himself and his uh, interests he chooses to love this world the people of this world and uh, you know make a sacrifice on their behalf Phileo, on the other hand, uh, is uh, more an emotional kind of a thing um, where it's like a tenderness that you're feeling. So that is why the Philoyo is mainly used to, you know, for friends, for family, people that you have a, um, a tender love towards. And so when we look at verses where it says, you know, where we are commanded to love the Lord, where we are uh, commanded to keep his commandments and therefore show our love for him uh, in, in these places, we have the word agape being used. So you don't really go on the basis of your emotions. You may be feeling tenderness or you may not be feeling tenderness, but it's a decision that you make. You choose to you know, express your love by doing a certain thing. And so agape love is commanded. Believers are expected and asked to show come, uh, agape love to the Lord, whether they feel like it or not. On the other hand, phileo is more about emotions, where you feel this deep tenderness towards someone because you regard them as your friend or your family member. And uh, no, which is why in John 14, 23, um, you know, Jesus says, if anyone agape me, he will keep my word and my father will agape him and we will come to him and make our home with him. On the other hand, when, uh, you know, the sisters, uh, Lazarus sisters are uh, um, sending a message to Jesus saying, you know, your, 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 um, the one that you love is, no, is, is sick. Uh, they, they say the one that you phileo, 
the one towards whom you have such a tender affection he is sick you know so uh, because um, uh, they knew that jesus looks on lazarus almost like a family member like someone very dear and precious to him so over there they use that tender word and they say you know the one that you phileo he is uh, sick um, so phileo is not an inferior kind of love and uh, john 5:20 brings out that very clearly uh, so if if you know if we could have one person uh, read out john 5:20 please John 5.20. Yes. Because for as the Father raised the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom I, he will. Oh, that's all I, right. I, yes. 5.20? Oh, sorry. That, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if John you could read out John 5. Yes, please. John 5, 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that he may marvel. So here it's talking about the Father, Phileo, the Son. Okay, so uh, he, he has this uh, tender affection towards the Son where it, he is willing to show him all the things uh, you know the hidden things which maybe would not be shown to uh, someone that he would not care for so here we have this special love being expressed the father phileo the son and shows him all things that he himself does he does not hold back anything uh, and you know jesus expresses the same sentiment you know uh, in another passage where he says now because you are my friends you know to a slave i would not be revealing all the things but then now that you are my friends I will you know, uh, reveal everything to you. So it's that kind of a phileo love that is being expressed over here. Uh, and uh, in John 16, 27, it says, the father himself phileo us, you know, the believers, uh, the disciples and the believers. The father himself phileo, phileo you because you have phileo me and have believed that I came forth from God. So uh, we see God also expressing phileo love towards Jesus and towards his people. And um, um, we see that this is just a more tender kind of a uh, love that is being expressed. So John, it's interesting to see, you know, he always addresses himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He never uh, directly refers to himself by name. And um, so in three places in the book of John, he you know calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. For example, John 13, 23, where it says one of them, the disciple whom Jesus agape was reclining next to him. So in three places, he addresses himself as the disciple whom Jesus agape. But then when you look in John 22, um, uh, it, it, over there, you know, it, it talks about uh, uh, Mary Magdalene coming to the disciples. It says there, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus phileo, and said, they have taken the Lord. Okay, so um, he uses this term interchangeably. In some places, he uh, considers himself as being agape by Jesus. In some places, he considers himself as being phileoed by Jesus. Uh, now, we took the effort to look at these terms because it kind of brings out the beauty of what is being you know, um, expressed here in this conversation between Jesus and Peter. And later, we will see something else which is also really uh, you know, beautiful uh, about this whole conversation. Um, but you know, just to go back to the very first portion, which we looked at last week. Uh, so in the big, right in the beginning, uh, the first time Jesus says to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me more than all of these other things? And immediately, um, you know, Peter replies and he says, you know that I fillet you, you, you know, I have this deep affection for you, Lord, and you know that is what he says. So he's not just simply saying, yes, Lord, I fillet you, you, but he in fact, you know, says, you know that I do, because if you can look into my heart, and if you were to look into my heart, you would very openly see 
that I do have this deep, tender affection, this friendship, uh, this deep love that I have towards you. And then we come to the second question where Jesus says, again, he asks the same question, do you agape me? And again, uh, you know, Peter replies and says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I have this, uh, you know, uh, deep affection towards you. And then Jesus says to him, tend my sheep. And then we come to the uh, verse 17, where uh, now is for the third time, uh, Jesus says to him, Simon, son of Jonah, he says, do you phileo me? So the third time he asks him the question, he is not using the word agape. He's now using the word phileo. And it says over there that Peter was grieved. And it explains why Peter was grieved. Peter is not feeling grieved because now this time Jesus has kind of come down in his standards and is asking him, do you phileo me? No, not at all. Um, uh, rather, it, ex it explains over there that the reason why Peter felt grieved is because he is being asked for the third time. And um, he immediately understands why he, the question is being posed to him three times, because obviously it is a reminder of what he has done three times earlier, where he has denied the Lord three times. And um, so it says here in 17, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? And uh, uh, so his reply is this. It says in verse 17, and he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. And then Jesus says to him, feed my uh, sheep. And, um, you know, one of the commentaries brings out this point that um, in the entire Gospel of John, there are just two Bible passages, you know, in the entire Gospel of John, uh, which happen in front of a fire, a charcoal fire. And uh, the first is, of course, you know, in the courtyard uh, when Jesus is being, you know, tried and um, Peter is warming himself by the charcoal fire. And over there in front of the charcoal fire, he denies Jesus. And now here they are at another charcoal fire, uh, which Jesus has lit up so that you know they can, uh, you know, roast the fish and have the meal. Uh, and uh, over here, um, this time, uh, you know, Peter he says, "Lord, I phileo you." And here he is expressing his uh, commitment. Um, so we see a contrast between the two episodes where you have a charcoal fire happening, and um, one aspect of this passage which always troubled me very deeply um, is the fact that Jesus brings up this issue and um, kind of seems to be hurting Peter deliberately and it just seems so out of character for the Lord to be doing that because uh, we have always been taught that uh, our God is a God once he forgives he forgives he doesn't bring up the matter again and again. He does not hold it in his heart against us, you know. And it's like uh, it's, not, it's, it's like he doesn't nurse a grudge against us for what we have done in the past. He says, "As far as the you know east is from the west, that far have I removed your sin." And and it's so comforting to know that our God is like that. And so it was always very very. Um, um, I don't know, very upsetting for me. And, and I could not really understand. I mean, there must be a reason why Jesus did this. But why? Why would he? Because it's very, very clear that Peter has repented. And Peter has, you know, um, uh, no longer is holding on to that kind of an attitude uh, where, you know, he, he would want to continue denying Jesus. No, he has completely changed. So uh, he has repented and Jesus has forgiven. And... Um, that is probably why Peter is now so grieved that Jesus is bringing up this issue once again. Uh, after it has been forgiven, it should have been forgotten. But now it's again being deliberately being, you know, the issue is once again being raised. And uh, uh, moreover, Jesus, who knows all things, who can now see inside Peter's heart so clearly and see that this poor man really does love the Lord and he is very much sorry for what has happened. Why would Jesus do something like this? You know, so um, we have uh, Bible passages which actually talk about how our sins will not be remembered anymore. Hebrews 8, 12, where it says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. We also have that in Hebrews 10, 17, Jeremiah 31, 34. Uh, in these passages, it talks about how once the Lord has forgiven, he will not remember our sins anymore. 
and uh, it is basically uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just you know just finish off this thing and yes we can definitely have your question so it's basically the accuser of the brethren who gen who tends to do this you know the one uh, in uh, revelation 12 10 where you have the term being used, accuser of the brethren. Um, it's the, he's the one who continues accusing us even after we have been forgiven. Uh, Jesus would never do that. So which means that Jesus had a very, very valid reason for bringing up this issue. And uh, we will see two points regarding that, you know, which brings out the beauty of what Jesus has done over here for Peter. Um, now, if your question is directly regarding this this matter then uh, we could address it later but if it is something else then please go ahead uh, but this is something i have not yet completed because there are two things uh, very clearly mentioned here in the passage which explain why jesus did this okay and it's he, he did it for peter not against peter and it's uh, it's a very beautiful thing to see because it's a it's a lesson that we can carry 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 away for our own lives uh, so uh, uh, please go ahead if uh, the question is related to something slightly different Oh, yes, Pastor. No, actually, it's placed yes. to an earlier, earlier sort of um, package. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know if there's any significance to uh, what Jesus uh, told Peter when he asked the question, you know, uh, you know that uh, uh, do you love me? So, in response to what Peter said, um, he first said, uh, you know, feed my lambs. Then, then the next time he said, tend my sheep. And mm -hmm. the third time, uh, he said, feed my sheep. So I just want to know if there's any significance to that. Um, uh, you know, feeding, tending. Uh, in one case, it is lambs. In one case, it is sheep. Yeah. So that is really my question. We um, kind of talked about it at the very beginning of the class. Um, you were there from the very beginning. You know, we talked about Bosco and that uh, other word, uh, Poimino, um, and we looked at the difference between the two, and. Um, Lambs, of course, are the younger believers, and the sheep would be the more mature, grown-up believers. But then we looked at the difference between Poemino and Bosco. It's there in the beginning of the video. Um, we, 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 we did cover that. Uh, it's, it's there. It's already been discussed. Um, okay, just to go over it again. Yeah, I, I think you probably know. You can, you can, you can go back to the video, and uh, you know, you can look it up later. Um, yeah. So yes. Um, Coming back over here uh, uh, to this passage. Uh, so Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. And then Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. OK, so uh, over here, Jesus is confirming the fact that one day Peter will be ma uh, martyred. Uh, and uh, so Jesus has raised this issue uh, to, to uh, clear up the matter once for all. Because probably Peter is still hurting on the inside, you know, still, you know, uh, deeply shamed for what he has done. And he has not recovered from this terrible uh, sin that he has committed. And now Jesus wants to assure him, you know, whatever has happened, you can safely put it behind you because a day is coming when you will stand for me to the point of death. On that day, you will have to stretch out your hands and you will be willing to do that. So it's an amazing word of assurance that Jesus is giving him. So. Jesus does not raise up this issue to condemn him. Rather, Jesus raised up this issue to bring healing, to help him know that he can move on from here uh, and uh, he never needs to look back. And you know, Paul also says the same thing. He says, you know, um, you know, forgetting what is behind. Uh, whatever has happened in the past, whatever Paul has done in the past is done. But looking on to what is ahead because uh, you know he has a master and a savior who uh, is is holding something special for him in the future who will equip him to you know run the race and uh, and and, and uh, re receive his reward so it's a very beautiful learning for all of us that um, when we have committed a very serious grievous sin against the lord when we repent of it truly 
the lord forgives us and he no longer holds it against us and we can have the assurance that he is going to build us up in our inner man that he is going to strengthen us and you know present us spotless before the father one day and we will go on um into the future where we will probably have to face a similar kind of temptation in the future and then, uh, on that day we will indeed be victorious because you know um, uh, he, it says in first john 1 9 he cleanses us he purifies us from all unrighteousness so not only does he forgive he also purifies so it's a complete work which god does it's not that he just accepts our sorry and says okay fine you're forgiven and just leaves us at that at that uh, place no he begins to purify us of that unrighteousness so that we are lifted to a higher level and one day we will indeed be victorious in that same area where we had once fallen and uh, so i think this this particular story was placed over here in the bible so that we can have the same assurance that was being given to peter that uh, in him we can have complete restoration and another lovely thing that came across to me as I was, you know, just meditating on this passage, that would be in verse 20. It says, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. And then, you know, Peter says, Lord, what about him? Um, so when after having the breakfast, you know, it looks like Jesus gets up takes Peter with him and they go for a walk. And these three questions are posed to him in private. You know, do you love me? He doesn't rub it in his face, the mistake which he made. He doesn't rub it in his face in front of everyone. They go away walking by themselves. And there's a private conversation which happens. And in that conversation, Jesus reveals, very truly, I tell you, you know, when, when Peter says, Lord, you know all things, Jesus says, yes, it's true. I know all things. And I'm telling you what's going to happen. This is how you are going to die for me. You are going to be willing to take the step which you were hesitant to take earlier. So um, Jesus builds him up and Jesus does this whole thing in private between the two of them. He doesn't do it. So for the Lord, the way he treats our fallenness, the way he treats our failures, it is so amazingly beautiful. He is a God who cares very deeply in building us up never in tearing us up. So um, he is the complete opposite of the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren only wants to condemn us and you know uh, pull us down, shame us. But the Lord, he is so careful about our dignity. He is the one who is always you know, guarding us, watching over us. And when he forgives, he forgives in such a way that we are lifted to a higher level. So. Um, these are some very beautiful teachings which come out of this passage. And I think it is important for us because we as believers, we tend to, even though we love the Lord, we tend to end up sinning, you know, uh, and uh, it's very painful when we do that. But this is how God, you know, wants to deal with our uh, failures when we repent. This is his attitude towards us. So we can draw great comfort uh, from this. All right. Um, so um yeah so peter out of curiosity asks he says okay lord what about him what kind of a you know end will he have and then jesus says that is not your concern you know because each person's story is their personal story god never goes around revealing other people's uh, personal details uh, even through words of prophecy unless he wishes to do so okay unless there is a purpose uh, for it so god never reveals uh, exposes our private lives our private matters to others unless there is some specific plan and purpose uh, for that and so we have the uh, john chapter 21 uh, you know concluding with these verses 24 and 25 um where uh, it says yeah, maybe we can actually read out verse 24 if someone could please read out 24 and 25, John 21, 24 and 25, if someone could read out. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did where every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Okay, so there are two uh, things mentioned here at the end of this Gospel of John. 
first there is a testimony of its accuracy okay we know that his testimony is true okay so uh, john is talking about himself the disciple who, is, who has written it all down and he says you know well, there are many witnesses there are people who are still alive today who are reading this uh, what i have written down and you know they too have a witnesses of what uh, of jesus uh, they have been with him they have walked with him so we are all people who have actually seen these things and so they will confirm that what i have written down over here is true uh, because many of the people were still alive right the ones who had uh, walked with jesus and knew about the events which took place they were still alive when john wrote down these things and he says we know all of our, all of us who can read this work we can confirm that the things being said over here are true so first we see that the testimony given in the book or gospel of john is accurate and the second thing that we see is that the testimony given in the gospel of john is incomplete in the sense uh, all the details could not be included but enough was given for us to be able to you know place our faith in jesus and be able to follow him Okay, so it just kind of concludes in that way. Um, uh, brother, is there an other doubt for which you have, you know, raised your hand, or is, or is this the previous one? Please go ahead. Yeah. It it says that you have raised your hand, so maybe this was for the previous question. Yeah. All right. Okay, then in that case, uh, you know, we'll um, uh, take a slightly early break. Uh, if we could come back at nine. 54 and we will uh, you know begin with an introduction to the first epistle of john so at 954 if we can all you know log back in thank you <laughs> 